What's up, sweaties? It's time to get extra sweaty. You're watching Collider Heroes, episode 42, where we're going to talk about superheroes and villains in the cinematic world, movie world, TV world, every world. John Schnapp, what's going on, everybody? <laughs> it's going to, it's going to, it's crazy, man. It's a lot of, a lot of cool news today. And with us, we've got, as always, we've got John Campia showing back up. What's up, John? We're talking Kardashians. We're talking <laughs> The Bachelor. That's, all worlds. That's all right. Worlds. All the worlds wrapped into the, our reality worlds. Reality worlds, <laughs> multiverses. Robert Meyer Burnett, ladies and gentlemen. I'm back here. Thank you for having me, John. John, uh, you know that 42 is, of course, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. That's, That's right. right. Yes, it is. And if you have not read some Douglas and Adams, thank you for all the fish. Get on that right now. Get, bring those dolphins back. Let's Very excited. Yeah, let's bring that beat back. Start. Let's start right off talking about Batman v Superman. What? Another villain has been revealed. So uh, Empire Magazine just broke out like 14 incredible still shots coming from Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. Um, We've got a lot of dramatic television spots that dropped on Sunday, revealing both Superman and Batman's headspace as to why they're actually going to war with each other. We've got J Zack Snyder talking about why he's using Doomsday. We've got, like I said, Empire Magazine releasing all these new pictures. And one that has a pretty heavy spoiler for an upcoming villain. Um, originally, I was like going to wait because I was like, I didn't know if this was rocking around the entire world, but everyone's talking about it. So if you're watching this show, then you probably already saw that picture right there yep. bam what is that now you know we saw this trailer batman v superman many many months ago we saw batman in his like nightmare costume now or whatever yep. they're calling it it's a cool outfit uh maybe like an elseworlds tip of the hat to mike mignola whatever he's fighting some like dudes with like superman symbols on their arms he's out in the desert we're like that's going to be a cool scene then we find out it's like a dream sequence we're like what's that about then a later trailer just about a month ago drops and we see like these flying like gnat like creatures and all of us like extra grown up sweaties were like yo those look like parademons right yep. <laughs> but that uh, can't be parademons it's just batman's having a nightmare how would he know what a parademon looks like right i remember like many months ago kevin smith was like man i was gonna bust a nut if i saw a boom tube show up i'm gonna cr start crying Guess what, man? I think Kevin just busted like 40 nuts because <laughs> that is the Omega symbol right there, and that is dark side. Let's talk about that. John, what your reaction? Well, the first, okay, you look at that picture. Let's bring up that picture again just for a second. So when you look at the picture, you can stand back and you'd be forgiven saying, oh, look, he's looking over a go-kart track. <laughs> There's a big go-kart track out in the desert. Gotham is investing in some city infrastructure. No, it's the Omega symbol. And it makes a lot of things make sense because, you know, we were talking about this over lunch before it was like when we saw those parademons i didn't think they were i mean they were parademons clearly they were parademons but we were thought oh, okay that's not really significant to the movie that's just like Zack snyder the folks at dc giving a little wink to the people who would know what those are supposed right. to be you know just a little thing <clears throat> nah they're obviously incredibly material to the story now that we see the omega symbol showing up and it opens up a possibility here that we hadn't really considered now think about this uh, some one of my followers on Twitter wrote this to me today. Sorry, I forgot who it was, but they said, "What if that isn't Bruce Wayne's nightmare? What if that's Wonder Woman's nightmare? What if Wonder Woman is getting a vision of what is coming to the world? And what if we've all been assuming? What if this pseudo doomsday? Because I refuse to call that thing doomsday. Right. What if this pseudo doomsday that we see in the trailer that ain't what brings Batman and Superman together?" What brings Batman and Superman in, I'm speculating just based on what we got here now, right? But what if ultimately what brings them together is the fact that Wonder Woman is having these visions about this greater threat that is coming, that neither of you two jerk-offs can stand up against alone. You're going to need each other. And therein lies Dawn of Justice. Not the pseudo-doomsday, but rather this vision of Darkseid. I think we're going to see Darkseid, not in the movie. I think we're going to see a post credit scene. I think we're going to get something, a.k.a. something along the lines of our first glimpse. We got a Thanos at the end of the first uh, Avengers. This is exciting. This is great. Very pumped. Yeah. Right. Why, look, <laughs> I love Apocalypse. I love New Genesis. I love Darkseid. I love the new gods. I love the whole fourth world. I love Jack Kirby's mythology. Now, as a kid, I always loved Darkseid. Now, I even loved The Final Crisis, which I still, I've read it like eight times. I don't even know what happens in that. I do know that Darkseid's looking for the anti-life equation. You know, I love that. <laughs> I'm like, Darkseid's looking for the anti-life equation, which is outstanding. I look at that Omega symbol and I'm thinking, has the Earth been devastated because he found the anti-life equation? I mean, it could be, this is this might be the sweatiest of all sweaty science fiction or superhero movies. Yeah. 
that have ever been made because mm -hmm. of the continuity that they're delving into. And I love the fact, one of the things that we saw drop this weekend was the TV spot where you saw Bruce Wayne elaborate more to Alfred about how he yes. feels about Superman when he's talking about this alien threat. Totally. You know, he can destroy us. Well, Bruce Wayne's on the right track, but they thought the Kryptonians were bad. Oh, yeah. They have not <laughs> visited they the have Apocalypse. They have not visited Apocalypse. They do not know what is coming. And that, 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 just, that image right there proves... I just love the fact that there's thought being put into this. Yeah. Like, if they're setting up the DC Universe, it looks like they're putting all the pieces in the right and place. And check it out. They're setting up Darkseid. They're setting up Apocalypse. That means they're setting up the new gods. So that just got me so crazy because well, that's like phase two of the DC universe when they actually get through Batman and Superman and Shazam and all these other, they do the Justice League part one and two, Dark Side's gonna be in there. But I think that there's such a, the, the DC universe is also very, very vast and it's been very underappreciated. The only time I've ever seen some of these characters actually used at all in the right way is through Bruce Timm's Justice League Unlimited. Right. So I think the, the, the DC Cinematic Universe is kind of taking a tip of the hat from, hey, look at the way they incorporated all these characters. We introduced the Justice League first, and then we introduced them to the rest of our incredible universe of characters. Oh, I didn't think, I didn't think Asgard would work in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Right. I was like, how do you go from Iron Man to Captain America, the first Avenger, to Thor. Like, right. how do you make that cosmic leap? And I thought it was easier in the case of the DC Cinematic Universe because you've got High Father and Metron and Orion and all the those characters. Um, I mean, are we going to see Granny Goodness? Hell yeah. <laughs> Is Granny Goodness oh, going to show up hey, in the DC Hey, they used her Cinema in Smallville. Right. I mean, they right. used her in Smallville. I, I, just, I can't <laughs> imagine that we're in Calabac and all the... Uh, all the I, I just, I'm so sweaty about this. And I, I love the buildup. The marketing, how they're dropping this stuff, because they know. It's fantastic. They, it's fantastic. I just hope the movie lives. And I, I, I really mm. like that theory of Wonder Woman being the one who has this vision. I don't She's 5,000 right, years old, we learned. But that may, that brings her to modern uh, Metropolis or Gotham. Whatever it brings her, you know, she's like, look, I had this vision. Maybe it comes at the beginning of the movie, but from what the way they describe this Batman nightmare scenario, it's like straight out of Mad Max. It's Batman, super savage style. I don't know. I cannot wait to see it. Well, they're also going to have to, you know, I'd heard a theory a, a while ago that a lot of people were objected to that that the Amazons could be an offshoot of the Kryptonians somehow right. that the Kryptonians. Oh, I, I've if, been kind of singing that tune for what maybe if two they're years. not? What if they're all part of New Genesis and Apocalypse? Mm. What if they're the the gods? What if the Amazons are offshoots of of them, and it ties it all back together? So Wonder Woman knows who dark side is right that does bring up the, the issue and i'm going a little bit off off the rabbit tail but let me ask both of you guys just to get your opinion on this you know when man of steel came out you've heard us reference this before when man of steel came out they put out that one shot prequel comic that was the prequel to man of steel and they went and it is canon they went out of their way to show kara crashing on earth and walking away you know, in that final frame is her. She survived the crash. She's out of her pod now, and she starts walking right. away. And they made a point to focus and give an entire frame just to that. Do you think either in this upcoming next set of movies or at some point they're going to address that? Or are they just going to let that go as a part of, yeah, she walked off, but then she died 50 years later? Like, how Do you, do you think we're going to see that have repercussions in the actual cinematic universe at this point? I would like to see them... Uh bring that up because that that's also in the man of steel movie where that one pod is empty one's empty open, that's so hers right. yeah that's hers i think it would make sense i don't know if i don't know how they're going to do that but uh i certainly hope so i mean I, maybe it's a melding of kryptonian and someone from apocalypse who's also on earth and we then she becomes the the foremother of of uh, the amazonians or right. of the atlanteans or of something else i mean it looks to me that a lot of thought has gone into this. Yeah. I mean, they've seen what Marvel, if they just look at the money mm. Marvel has taken in yep. and will continue to take in and how the, the films have so built upon one another right. into this cohesive whole, which no one has ever really done. Right. You would have thought it never would have worked. Five years ago, if you told me the Marvel Cinematic Universe would work as well as it have, I would have said, you guys are nuts. So they knew what they had to do. The, the DC Universe, I mean, Jeff Johns, he was on that special with Kevin yeah. Smith last week. Yep. Clearly, you've got comic creators. They, I think they know what they did wrong with Green Lantern. They've spent, I think, a long time. The fact that this movie is so tied into Man of Steel, 
proves that they've been really thinking long and hard that this this film looks like it's really well thought out. And that's what makes great genre cinema is when people really know what they're doing and they know where they're going. It's not haphazard. Hmm. It's yeah. not made up like other franchise pictures we've seen recently. Well, look at it. Like you say, stay on target. It's like I think Marvel has been really great at being like, look at our look at our worlds that we have in the comic books. Let's it's a deep, rich world. Let's draw from that. And that's why you're seeing all these different storylines that have been from the past and even the present being drawn into Marvel. And I think that's DC was like, hey, that's the right way to go. So let's move on. We're going to actually talk about DC a little bit more and that exact point. But let's first get swap on over to Planet Hulk, yo. <laughs> Planet Hulk is going to be in Thor Ragnarok. We've been hearing quite a bit about the upcoming Thor Ragnarok film with Kate Blanchett playing Hela. The film being described as like a buddy road trip film between Banner and Thor. We got director Taika Watiti saying the film's humor will have a brand new fresh kind of style. And now we have this. From geek.com comes story points of Thor being banished to the gladi to a gladiator type planet where he's got to fight his way up to the current champion, the Hulk. This new green giant has been able to stop from re returning back to Bruce Banner. And now he's got both personalities combined. And, and then he's going to hang out with Thor, I guess, and you know have to squash Hela and Loki teaming up. So what do you think of this info, Robert? Well, I think what's cool is maybe the Hulk has, again, lost his memory, doesn't know exactly who he is, is not reverting back to Bruce Banner, doesn't know. And he's like in the Planet Hulk storyline, he's just been fighting, fighting, fighting. And it's Thor that rattles him out of his, you know, gets him back to who he really was, finds the banner within him, Hulk, and that's mm -hmm. where it changes. I think that's a great idea, and I think it's a great way, the same way they use the Winter Soldier, they didn't use, like, all 40 issues of Brubaker's run as, right. the, you know, on the Winter Soldier storyline. They used some. And I think this is a great way to go back and incorporate... The Planet Hulk story was a big, long, sprawling story that might not necessarily have supported... A movie like they might not have wanted to make a Planet right. Hulk movie, but this is a way to incorporate that storyline in a very truncated yet very effective version right. that makes great use. They're doing a great job mining these stories, and I, I can't wait. Yeah. I want to see the knockdown ever since Avengers when mm. Thor smashes Hulk, which is one of that great, yeah. the great moments in the movie. I want to see the knockdown drag out battle between not the Hulk Buster right. and Hulk, but I want to see two Thor guys go Hulk. mad. Yeah. Mano in Mano. an arena, and then outside of that arena, right. and then they I team up. I want to see up. what arena could even hold those two. Yeah, they're gonna both be on like <laughs> weird camels, like alien camels, like cracking jokes at some point, right? I, uh, you know, maybe singing a song or two. I hope just they like bust Hope, out. hope and Crosby. I want them to bust out in a song. What do you think, John? I I don't believe the report. No, uh, I don't believe the report. It's it's not uh, a source I generally consider one of my trusted ones. Not, not that I have negative feelings towards it either. So there's certainly the, the possibility that it's real. But I also remember Kevin Feige a couple years ago. Kevin Feige, who's not J.J. Abrams. Kevin Feige saying a couple years ago that, you know, any Planet Hulk kind of storyline is not on the table right now. Right. Now, that was a couple years ago. That So things could have changed. So basically, I don't believe the report. I don't believe this is true. Now, let's assume it is mm -hmm. for a second. If it is... It's fascinating. It'd be really interesting to see what kind of direction they go with it. I I don't know if I want to see Hulk and Thor fighting each other again, because I've kind of already been given that. I don't know that I want to see Hulk not have his proper mind again, because we just had that in uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. Mm -hmm. I want if, if they're doing this, I want to see, a like you were describing him, a true Banner Hulk merger mm -hmm. that that banner and hulk are now one he's fully in control of his faculties they set up some reasonable thing in the storyline that explains why these two guys now got to go at it mm -hmm. and if that's the case i'm on board at this point though i just trust whatever they're doing right now so if they're going to do this it I'm, it's trust probably about to be trust good feige yeah you know i think and and again i know nothing about the film i don't i have not talked to anybody in marvel but i would assume because it's called Thor Ragnarok. Correct. Thor gets banished or sent somewhere, and he they want him to die. Right. They've sent him this to this arena like Maximus and Gladiator. They've sent him to die, and and it just happens that Hulk is there. Thor's got to get back to fight Rag the Ragnarok, the War of the Gods, whatever the end yeah. of all things is going to happen, and and Thor's going to step in in Act Three with the Hulk 
to kick some god ass to fight the man god I mean, son we, bring out that man god it's going to be it's the, we're going to see the battle of asgard and yeah. thor's going to be leading the troops and I don't think, forget yeah. one of the other things that was in that same report one of the, and the other warriors things, 3 got to come back oh they have to i mean but one of the things that was in that report that what happened is supposed to happen early in the story again i don't believe the report but this is what the report says that uh uh, Mjolnir gets destroyed yes. early on. So Thor is without his hammer. He's still Thor, right. but he's without his hammer, so that would be an interesting Now, is this well. another way to bring in Beta Ray Bill? They got to cast a brand new hammer. He gets off the the war planet while Thor and Hulk are on it and gets Thor's hammer, gets, you know, we don't know that that's getting super sweaty. But, but you know I'm what? Saying, you know, Feige with his group of people that are just fanning him I with know. those comics. He's got at least six. He's fanners. in his inner sanctum like he's his Doctor Strange sanctum coming I'm, up with the coolness. I'm coming out of X Files, I wanna believe. So geek.com, you better be right. <laughs> I, I like it. I want that direction to happen. So speaking of getting sweaty, Kevin Smith, he just talks about an interview that got cut short when he was on that special with Jeff Johns. If you saw last week's special that aired with Kevin Smith and Jeff Johns, uh, where they talked about uh, Justice League, Wonder Woman, and Suicide Squad, it was a CW special. Um, you know it was quite an event. Well, Kevin dropped this bomb just a couple days ago. He said, we did a piece where we talked about how DC is known for nothing if not a multiverse. So at which point, I was like to Johns, could they effing cross over? And he was like, Ah, uh, hmm. So doors are being left open and stuff like that. Smith explained. Think about this. You can have Ezra Miller be the Flash, and you could also have Grant be the Flash because there's a multiverse at work. What do you think about the multiverse being introduced in the movies since the, since they've already done this in the DC television universe with the Flash himself? Robert, what do you think? Well, I mean, look. I, I again, I'm a DC fanboy from way back. It's going to be hard. I, I want. First of all, I want it to happen. I'd love to see it, right. but it's got to be done again in a clever, interesting way uh, because the cinematic universe is very different from a television universe. And how do you make that work without – they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars right. on these movies. They're not spending hundreds of millions of dollars on those TV shows. So you have to make it worthwhile, make that crossover work. It's not an easy thing to do, right. I don't think, but I think it can be done because – as I've said on the show before, the DC crossovers when I was a kid, the Justice League of America and the Justice Society teaming up was the greatest thing yeah. ever. And if they can figure out a way, which we'll see. We don't, they don't have Kevin Feige, but we'll see what happens after Batman v Superman. If, if we believe, if you believe, like Fox Mulder still I believes. I want to believe. I want to <laughs> believe. I want to still believe. Still believe. <laughs> if that's going to happen, yeah. and if they make us believe, because Batman v Superman is going to answer a lot of questions right. about the direction of this universe. They, they, they. It's probably the most ambitious comic book film ever made. Yeah, the most expensive. What last I heard is three hundred and fifty million. John, what do you think about this? Um, you know, I, I still go back to one thing that the WB exec said about about seven months ago. We have no plans to cross over our television and movie universe. Now, keep in mind too, about four months ago, Ezra Miller was being interviewed, and he was. He wasn't being serious. He was kind of joking around, but still, he uttered the words like, "You know, there's multiple universes in the comics." But like, so he's the notion has been toyed out there. I'm one of those guys, you know this. I do not like the idea of crossing over the movie and their television universe. I love them crossing over their TV shows, Legends of Tomorrow, which, by the way, the first episode wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, the, I love it when they cross over the Flash and Arrow together, but I, I still totally believe. You handcuff the creativity of the television shows and of the movies to a degree when you cross over those universes. You limit what they can do instead of just giving them a free reign to do whatever they want to do. And you pointed, made a great point. It would just aesthetically feel so jarring because you're going from one world that has $200 million budgets right. to another world that has a million dollar budget for a show. It, I think aesthetically it would be odd and weird, but don't count out anything moving further down the line. I just don't think we're going to see anything in the immediate They would future. have to comment on be like, man, this this whole your whole universe is a little bit cheaper this and is, shoddier. This is like the Walmart than, version yeah, of our universe. It, it would be really funny to see that happen. I, I personally think that this multiverse is happening but it's it's a really smart way to do it. It's not like it's not like Marvel where they have like Agent Coulson's over there with the uh, Agents of Shield, and over there we got Daredevil, and but we're over here in the Marvel cin cinematic world. We're all in the same 
universe, but we don't really hang out and never really cross paths that much like in the comics do. I think this multiverse way is a very clean way to explain how you can have five different Supermans and three different Flashes. Like, already how many Flashes we have just in the TV show alone, we have multiple Flashes. So well, the also, origin is also very similar to the, the Flash's origin. So. Well, that's what I was going to say. The, the original multiverse, the, the cosmic treadmill, the Flash of two worlds. Right. That was from, I believe that the, the, the CW Flash can cross over into the DC Cinematic Universe, and you can make that work. Could you make Arrow work? Don't know. Right. But I think the Flash could work. I believe that we could see two Flashes together, and maybe that's the only point of demarcation that they'll mm. have, but I buy that. I don't necessarily buy Supergirl standing next to Henry Cavill's Superman. Mm. And that could be a little weird. But, but if it happened, I wouldn't be mad at it. No, I, I wouldn't either like if it's done well. Again, but I think that what's happening... I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to force everybody at Warner Brothers, they've got to step up their game. Mm -hmm. Because if they falter, Marvel will crush them. Yeah. And, and they're going to be beholden to their shareholders who are going to be like, uh, yeah, another Marvel movie just made $750 million worldwide. Why could you guys not with Batman and Superman? If it's not great, there's going to be hell to pay at Warner Brothers. Yeah. Well, let's. We're gonna hold out. We're gonna hold out, and I. I want to believe. Yeah. I want. It's to so believe. soon. It's very it's soon. It's coming so soon. It's not now. three years away anymore. No, it's, it's like two, two months. Uh, two months. Two. Gonna have an aneurysm thinking about that. Speaking of aneurysms, Deadpool. He goes off. He's got brand new TV spotlight highlights and uh, a lot of other stuff. He's going into overdrive. Uh, they're pushing it. This viral marketing. It's being released February 12th. We've got a lot of new TV spots highlighting Weasel, Bl uh, Blind Al, Colossus, and with quick shots of the X Mansion and Blackbird. We see Deadpool's uh, release this very special uh, tribute to Australia Day for a lot of Australians. <laughs> it was hilarious. And he took over Fandango's Twitter account. The viral madness continues. What's your favorite part of this Deadpool? Robert? Uh, seeing Deadpool in the X Mansion. I mean, if there was ever, <laughs> we've been talking on the show previously about how is Deadpool going to fit into the continuity. This is one thing that I have not, I should call up Brian and ask him, mm. dude, they were on your set. Mm. Or did you just send over a flat or something so right. you could have the door? I, even though it's just a brief shot, I don't know if it's a dream sequence, if they're really <laughs> in the X Mansion, I probably think they are in the X Mansion. Right. That to me, I got super sweaty. I'm like, Deadpool is firmly established in the Marvel Mutant Universe, in Fox's Marvel Mutant Universe. Right. I'm sure it just makes Kevin Feige a little bit angry. Somehow I missed, I missed that ad where it's like, I want you to put it in my, will you marry me? Uh, Jinx? <laughs> I was like, wow. That's my kind of girl. Yeah. That's some R-rated action. What about you, John? Um, I want to see... That first of all, that Australian spot he did was hilarious. Now yeah. I want being being the fact that Ryan Reynolds is Canadian, I'd love to see him do one of that for Canada as well. Because oh, I think he great. could just rip so well. That would be great. I, you know, I think my favorite moment out of all the marketing so far, and there's been so much great marketing on this. Best, I still contend, best marketing campaign we've ever seen. Not not the best individual trailer, but the best overall marketing campaign I've ever seen for a film. It's the best, best transmedia oh, marketing yes. campaign. Yeah. I mean, in terms of everyone's always talked about, well, we're gonna we're gonna promote it over different platforms. No one has more effectively promoted this movie over multiple yeah. platforms than Fox has. No, this cool. this marketing campaign has turned what I would have thought four months ago to be, hey, Fox will be thrilled if this opens with thirty eight million. Thirty eight to forty two million right on mm -hmm. it has now transformed into something that 90 85 to 105 million is not unrealistic it could still open to 50 million absolutely right. but but now it's not outside the realm of, of rationality that it could it could hit a million i, I would like to bring up I yes hate, I, I know hate, i hate to say that chris gore is going to lose 25 bucks on camera but I think he's probably gonna. I, I said I what bet was the him. Bet? The bet is for twenty five bucks. I said Deadpool will make a hundred million on its opening weekend. And he said it won't. Okay, that's a that's it's tall. R rated. That's that a, is tall. That's a I know. Tall order, I know. Man. I'm probably gonna lose, but I because but of this be viral close. marketing, it made me so excited, and I believe that enough sweaty fans are going to get out there and put their dollars down and see it Friday and see it again on Saturday. Let's make that thing happen. If the movie's awesome, if the movie, uh, if the movie's not as great as we want it to be, then I'm totally, I have no problem giving that 25 bucks to Chris Gore. But I think that it's going to make 
over a hundred million here's, because it's such a a, a powerhouse. But the, you don't think the R rating is going to hurt it like kids? There's yes, that, I think the R rating is really going to hurt. But it how much half. will it hurt it? Right, like it's going to stop it from being a Star Wars two hundred fifty million. Good parents movie. will take their kids to see that. <laughs> I mean, this That's humor, this humor is it's very adult. But here's the genius. Here's the genius of this market you brought up. If all the sweaties get out there and see it, maybe can make a hundred million dollar. No, it won't, and it won't need to. The genius of this marketing campaign is that they have made it so funny and so witty and gone through the right channels that now, six months ago, this was one that they only could get the sweaties out to. Mm -hmm. Now, Ashley Mova wants to go see oh, this. Oh, yeah. No, it's you know? true. Natasha Martinez wants to go see this. And, well, she always wanted to see it. But there are girlfriends now across the country, even though they know it was joking and right. mocking, the very fact that they have reached out to those demographics, I am talking to more women now today who are dying to see this. And that's the key. That's if a this big thing crosses that $100 million, uh -huh. It's going to be because they did that, That's and true. they did it brilliantly. I agree. Well, uh, more well than anything, said. it bodes well for the future. I mean, I'm really hoping that if this movie, if this transmedia campaign works, and it was able to get dads and moms and who are going to be horrified that their 12-year-old kids also want to see Deadpool. <laughs> but uh, if they bring in that, it bodes well for the future of all genre cinema. Of all, you, you never know what characters we're going to see. I mean, are we going to see Amazing Man right. you know, from DC? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> maybe but, not. But maybe if they can pull off Deadpool this way, it, it bodes well for the future of all superheroes. Bodes what really well for R-rated X-Force. Oh, that would be crazy. Cable. Speaking of crazy, Minor Mutations, let's rock on into the Minor Mutations where we're going to talk about some news of the week and uh, pick some of the stuff we want to talk about. We've got Supergirl versus Supergirl. Bizarro lives in the newest Supergirl that's coming up. We uh, we saw a Jessica Jones promo reveal the Luke Cage premiere date in its picture there. It's a it, is that a little Easter egg for us to know when we're going to see the Luke Cage series on Netflix? Number three, we've got Mr. Freeze poster is out for Gotham City. Of course, uh, they have no one to fight uh, Mr. Freeze because Batman doesn't exist yet. Um, number four, we've got <laughs> Reverse Flash returning for an upcoming Flash. Uh, and then finally, we've got Don Cheadle talking of War Machine's possible fate in Civil War and beyond. Uh, what sticks out to you guys? Uh, John Campia, what do you think? Well, okay, as, as some, I've, I've said before, I, I still think The Flash is the best superhero show on television right now. And after last week's episode, well, this isn't much of a spoiler because we're kind of the the post credit flash has a post credit scene at the end of every single episode and this one was Eobod Thawn showing up man and it was reverse flash and I was sitting there I'm watching it with my wife right and my wife is total junkie of the flash and she he showed up he goes oh, my wife like jumps at her what the fuck <laughs> she's like yeah, at the TV. Uh -huh. so excited to see him back so that's the one that really uh jumps out to <laughs> me the most so I'm really excited to see him back how about you Robert well you know of course I don't want to see Don Cheadle die because he has a great Die cast War Machine Hot Toys figure. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that make it more valuable? <laughs> it Maybe. might raise the price. It might. <laughs> with that Thanos dropping this week for four hundred dollars. That's right. No, I love Don Cheadle's War Machine. I mean, I, I, I think he brings a great freshness to the part, and I know they need to kill somebody. You know, well, they're gonna yeah. replace him. They got Anthony Mackie being Falcon. I get it, but I, I don't want to see War Machine. Die. I do I think not want to see War Machine die. I think he's gonna die. Really? I think Rhodey Rhodes is going to die. But when you think about it, you think about it for a second, and I don't, I don't know if he's going to die or not. I don't. But I don't either, by the way. I have no idea. They, if, and who says anybody has to die? But if somebody did die, think about it this way. The, the brilliance of having War Machine die is the fact that he is, he's not a throwaway character in this universe. No. Like, unfortunately, Quicksilver ended up being in, right. in the first one. Right? He's not a throwaway character. He's been with us now for a number of films, right? Also... What kind of impact? Quicksilver's death had no impact on anybody. Rhodey dying would have immense emotional impact on one of your lead characters being Tony Stark. Huge emotional impact, which would fuel the fire of the resentment probably between Cap and Tony. Right. Look, I'm not saying it is going to be War Machine. I'm not. But I'm saying I think logistically, if you sit down and path it out, it would fit, and it would serve a really Someone good purpose. Someone has to die, and I say it's Captain America. No, I, so, I, just from the <laughs> comics, that's what's happening. So. I agree with you, though. I mean, somebody does, and I agree with you as well. Someone has to die. Right. I, otherwise, they can't. There's got to be stakes. They bring this, Quicksilver back, and he dies five, again five <laughs> this, minutes later. He dies so again. This, death, yeah. this death has to hurt. Yeah. It's got to hurt. It's got to hurt. Yeah. I think it's the death that's going to lead to the fracturing of the team mm. that's going to lead into the Infinity War. 
The team is, you know, you got to destroy the Avengers before you bring them back together. Sure. Get that brand new team up like you always have. Avengers assemble. Who's up? You know, a whole bunch of new people. Kick uh, ass. For me, I, I like that their Supergirl is just bringing in all this different flavor and just bringing in a Bizarro Supergirl. If you ever read any Superman comics, you know who Bizarro is. It's a weird character. So it's nice to see them being able to put that in. And, and it, it's going to work. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Bizarro is a weird character. I'm not sure. So I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the next I thing. I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, flashback, where we talk about a movie from the past and just reflect on it, whether it was good, bad, how did it affect superhero films. We're going to talk about Batman Begins. 2005, the cinematic world suffered on June 20th, 1997. That was the day Batman and Robin was unleashed upon this planet, and the destructive cracks and fartonic ripples were felt by all grown-up geeks like a triple aneurysm sucker super punch, super sucker punch across the entire world. Yes, if you were five, I can see how the neon colors and childlike script could hypnotize your unfinished brains and make you enjoy this disgusting coloring book abomination. But for us adults who liked our Batman written by Frank Miller, this was indeed a crime against cinematic nature. We had to wait for eight long years until they cracked the code and gave us back the true Dark Knight that we all really wanted. Batman Begins is a perfect origin movie and one of the greatest superhero reboots of all time. Rising from the candy-colored dreck to embrace the Batman's true birth, but updated with a fresh spin, incorporating many different comics as its source material, and using villains who had yet to be used from Batman's amazing rogues gallery, Ra's al Ghul and the Scarecrow. Let's talk about Christopher Nolan's masterpiece, Batman Begins. Who wants to start? It's it's a it's a solid, wonderful film. I I mean I I don't call it a masterpiece like say The Dark Knight was. I think The Dark Knight was an escalation. Mm -hmm. I think I think yeah. what Nolan Nolan was able to do, what very few filmmakers or studios have ever been able to do, take a really good first movie and actually make a better sequel. But The Dark Knight doesn't exist without Batman Begins. And you know a lot of people were scratching their heads at the casting, I remember this so vividly, at the casting of Christian Bale. It's like, the dude from American Psycho? Whereas I was like, the dude from American yeah. Psycho? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and the only bit of disappointment I had with the casting of, of Christian Bale was that I had heard that the other guy in the prime running for the role was, uh, uh, why am I uh, forget, from Memento? Christopher Nolan's oh, lead Memento. Guy, uh, uh, Pierce. Guy Pierce yeah. was Guy Pierce, and I was kind of excited to see Guy Pierce in the role. But when the Christian Bale, I was still very excited. But a lot of people were scratching their heads of it at the time. And remember what Nolan had to face. He was coming on the heels of Batman and Robin. He had to not just introduce a character to an audience and get them to love him. He had to get them to forget about a lot of that garbage that came before. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, movies like. Uh, Brian Singer's X-Men had come along and kind of reset the clock and gave a clean slate. Spider-Man had, Spider had come out and given a new clean slate for a Batman universe to be reintroduced. But man, if it wasn't for Batman Begins, we never would have had the Dark Knight. And just what he was able to do, and I love the fact, ah, I, I kind of wish they handled the League of Assassins a little bit different. But other than that, it was a solid film, a great film, set it up for a great future ahead of it. It was a monumental feat that Nolan accomplished. Definitely. Well, you know, I think right? one of the, the most important thing, the most important lesson that Hollywood, especially Kevin Feige, has taken from this movie is you took a filmmaker that had made his bones in the independent world. Nolan had made Following, he'd made Memento. And then Warner Brothers brought him on to do the remake of Insomnia with Robin Williams and um, Al Pacino. Yeah, which right? was awesome, by Which the was way. awesome. And so he had become, he, he, he was plucked from the indie world, total auteurist filmmaker. Memento was a, a great feat of independent filmmaking. It really set the indie world on its ear. Totally. He was given a chance to do a studio movie. They cultivated his talent. Mm -hmm. They brought him up and they went to a guy. They, they could have picked any tentpole filmmaker that was working. They didn't. Warner Brothers went out of the box and said, okay, look, our last Batman movie was a huge failure. It's a moribund franchise. Nothing's gonna happen with this. We're gonna take a Hail Mary, or maybe not a Hail Mary. They, they, they promoted a guy from within that they believed in his talent, which is what the future of Hollywood must be. Now, you've got to promote and let people make smaller films and promote them from within. They gave Nolan a shot, and Batman Begins is an auteurist movie in every sense of the word. Remember when we first saw pictures of the Tumblr mm -hmm. as the oh, Batmobile? Yeah, yeah. We're like, what is that? It's right. like a souped-up Lamborghini, and right. it kind of looks like it's from The Dark Knight, but what? And it worked beautifully, and it was the tone was serious. 
uh, that was the thing that really strikes you about that film is the tone is relentlessly serious. Yeah. It's never, and it creates a world that, as much as Ridley Scott created Blade Runner, right. you didn't need Anton first doing what Tim Burton did in right. the first Batman. It created its own world, yet it was still believable. You still believe that Gotham might be a city you could drive to. It's someplace that might exist in our. You might world. not want to drive there. <laughs> no, you might not. But you know what? I, I I appreciate what you just said because it is true. It was it it, it lived in a, it, all these comic book movies all live in a comic book world that's like slightly off center from reality. But I think what Nolan did was he made it a bit more plausible. Like no one's going to be dressing up as a bat. You got to have something a little off center. He cast someone like Christian Bale. And I remember going to WonderCon back when it was in San Francisco, like a few months right before they announced it. And it was like, I think they had just announced it and Christian Bale showed up. I missed the panel because it was sold out. But it was like, all of us were kind of like, are they going to get Christian Bale? He would be awesome because I had seen him in Equilibrium. And I was like, that dude would be a good Batman for like a lot of people. That was just rolling around a lot. And I think he was up for being Batman in the Wolfgang Peterson Batman v Superman. I think his name was bandied about mm. back in 2001 or two or something like that. So um, he ended up becoming what I think is a truly iconic Batman, just like Michael Keaton has his uh, Batman that is firmly entrenched. Just like Adam West, we have the Christian Bale Batman. So these stamps of this character and who the double side of Bruce Wayne and the Batman and how they portray them and the mythology behind it is different in all of these different, uh, you know, films and television shows and now we've got obviously Ben Affleck putting his stamp on with Snyder but uh, you know Batman Begins for me was great on so many levels not only just because I'm a giant Batman fan and I really wanted a really good Batman film because I was remember being hurt when I saw not crying in a corner hurt but just bummed out because I was like up oh, that there goes the franchise it's over you know it was like because I can't see it anymore even if it was a giant hit I just wouldn't watch any more of those versions of Batman because it was garbage to me. So to, to bring it back to the core essence of what a lot of people who, a lot of millions and millions of people who loved Batman from even the night, even if they didn't read comics, they saw the Tim Burton Batmans and they liked that version. I think it was that strange, like we not we need to sell toys, this and that, and like, you know, counter guessing what the public actually wanted is why we went that path of like going back to neon colors and goofy mm. But you know what else it did? The tone wasn't horribly, relentlessly dark. There's the relationship you had with Morgan Freeman. Yes. And how the technology yeah. that Bruce Wayne developed. You believed all that. It was there was an element of fun Definitely. that did not destroy the tone. And that's a really hard thing to do that takes an auteurist filmmaker to understand how to do that with his screenwriter. He worked with David Goyer, yeah. you know, who's, who's remained in, as part of the DC Cinematic Universe. They worked together, the score, oh, yeah. James Newton Howard yeah. and uh, Hans Zimmer working together on these things. I mean, and that's a really tough, it was the tone that they nailed that wasn't too oppressive, mm -hmm. still had fun. The Scarecrow yeah. was scary as heck, but still yeah. fun yes. too. The and design it, element of Scarecrow and how they handled him was so perfect. Amazing. Perfect for the a big great screen. hot toy action figure, by the way. <laughs> Came as a two pack with nightmares. Speaking of hot toys, this week's spotlight: Savage Dragon by Eric Larson. So we've got the Savage Dragon series. It was published under his own imprint, Image Comics. This creator-owned book came out right next to the other Image Comics, Spawn, yeah, Young Blood, a whole bunch of other ones. And uh, this was basically the, the the seven big artists leaving Marvel and DC to form their own imprint company and create their own characters. So this is actually the longest running independent sequentially numbered series made by original writer artist himself, Eric Larson, in history. It follows a super powered, green skinned, thin headed amnesiac who becomes a Chicago cop and then fights insane villains with names like Cyberface. It's already been an animated series for two seasons. That was a couple of years back. Uh, would this comic book series uh, be best live action TV or movie? What do you think, John? Um, I think we covered Savage Dragon on episode three of Heroes. Yes, but, uh, but the reason I'm revisiting a lot of the ones that I covered in the first two because I did three at a time. Yeah, that's right. We, we didn't have rat, a, a lot of time it, to so really I go I want on. to bring back ones that I think are really The fascinating doing. thing, what now a lot of times, I, I'm going to confess this, but I say it on the show, a lot of times, a lot of spotlights you bring, I'm the one guy on the panel going, no, don't think that would work, don't think it would work. The, what makes Savage Dragon different is the character mm -hmm. himself. And when you look, a, a cop in the, the world that they set up, right. there's so much you can do there with that. There is so much. And you know, a lot of times when we see a comic property that we like, we go into the idea of a TV show or movie with a certain style in mind. 
This is a property that you could do about four or five different ways totally. and they could all totally work. So this is one I'd be totally on board for. Right on. What do you think though? TV or movie or either or? I'm going to go TV. Normally when I say yes, I go movie, but I'm actually going to go TV on this one. Right on. How about you, Robert? You know, this is, we've seen Powers, which is a comic book right. I dearly love. Uh, the show, not, I don't know yet. The show is okay. Right. But, but to me, this is sort of the flip side of that. Again, it's a procedural, but you've got a superhero. I like the fact that in the comic, all the meta humans were called super freaks. Right, super mm. freaks. They were called super freaks. You <laughs> they know, had the freak force later. Right, and, yeah. and it was it was the the. So you realize it's it's not. It looks like it would be this goofy, funny. I remember I the, it, the comic was a miniseries first. This incarnation. Mm. The thing about Savage Dragon was Eric Larson came up with this character when he was a little kid. Right. See, kids, if you keep if you start early and keep drawing, <laughs> you can make your dreams come true. There were different incarnations of the figure, but. But I liked what the tone could be. It could be it could be fun, mm -hmm. but still serious. It can still be brutal, but they're still super freaks. Yes, you know, there's it's not Jack Kirby Fourth World. You could still make it a, a, a procedural that has grit in it. Mm -hmm. But I just don't know. I think a TV show would be good, but mm -hmm. I don't know how you do that main character. It's got to have tongue in cheek. Like the comic book series, Eric to Larson me, the adds Rock. a lot of humor to the comic book. There's a lot of a lot humor of in humor. there. There's a lot of adult situations yes, in the comic. Yes, very much so. Um, you know, at one point, I believe that he fights God, God and the devil get involved. There's a lot of really fun, epic moments throughout the entire run. I can't even remember right now off, like I think they're in, into issue like 238 or 240. Some like some of like high numbers. Uh, and like at one point he, he threw Savage Dragon into this in completely other universe where it started like the actual comic had like a night like the 1970s style Marvel comics like you know image universe with the little face just it looked like you were reading a 19 like 70s comic but it was like a command eye Jack Kirby freaky universe where he's fighting weird aquatic monsters and it's just I mean it would go crazy like whatever he wanted he was like look I'm tired of telling these stories here in Chicago he's going into another universe we're going command eye for like 25 issues <laughs> then we come back and the world's completely different so in true comic book form i think this series can go all over the place and take its time i agree with you i think it would be, be what best suited as a procedural television series that went off the rails in the end of the second season and they're you're like in the planet of the apes world you know? remember, you'd have to find a way to do it low budget yes. you'd have to find yeah. a way to do it with a reasonable budget I remember somebody saying, and I, this always struck me as like it was a kind of weird thing to say, but somebody said it was halfway between the Marvel Universe and Vertigo. Huh, I, I remember I reading that, say and that. I was like, no. I, I, but I always thought that was weird. Like, how do you go from the Marvel Universe and Vertigo? First of all, you're going Marvel DC, right. but then Vertigo. Like, I was like, you said it's a. It, you never knew what this comic was going to do, which was kind of its appeal. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of this crazy. It was never the same. See, when I hear Vertigo, I think Sandman or Swamp Thing or darker creature. Like well, said, it wasn't as pretentious. They said it could Vertigo, but less pretentious. All right, well, yeah, but then Somebody's that's not Vertigo. But I don't <laughs> even think, I don't say Vertigo is pretentious. I just think it had like, this is our universe. We're sticking to it. Everything else get out. So I don't but know. This if comic, it's, it went all over the place. Like you said, it could, yeah. you never knew what you were going to do. I think, yeah, I, I love that Eric Larson is committed to this comic book. And that's why you have to respect comic book artists and writers, especially as a writer artist who's been writing and drawing this comic every month since like, I think when Image, when did since Image 91. first? 91, 21, 1991, years. 25 years. That's incredible. Quarter century. Yeah, that man deserves a TV show. Give him one. All right, here we go. We're rocking into the Twitter questions. First off, we got Jason Schaefer asking, do you think Civil War will end like the comics with Cap surrendering? His death wasn't part of the actual conflict. What do you guys think? Nope. What do you think? No. I, I surrendering that's kind of a anticlimactic something bad's gonna yeah, happen. Yeah. I I believe surrendering is if you mean death, then that's because remember some dying. <laughs> I know. It, it basically it's <laughs> Avengers 2.0. The Avengers team has to be <clears throat> fractured. Yeah. We got we've got Doctor Strange and then we've got Thor Ragnarok. Right. So we're not gonna be on Earth or we're not gonna be on the Avengers. We're not yeah. gonna be in the Avengers New York, right. wherever they're gonna be. We're not gonna see them for a while. Right. You gotta leave him on a bad note. And does Doctor Strange have the time, Jem? And does that involve Steve Rogers? Who knows? You know, we're conjecturing now. But you know, if Captain America doesn't die, he's gonna like stop being Captain America. That's my guess. It's like he goes, he's like, I'm done. I'm giving up the outfit or whatever. He becomes totally disenfranchised with, you know, he was working for Shield, their Hydra. Who do you trust? All that kind of stuff. So follow up question. Uh, you mentioned uh, Doctor Strange is coming now in Ant Man. 
They bolstered the interest in it by bringing in an Avenger. They brought in Falcon. Mm. In Doctor Strange, could we see an Avenger pop up in Doctor Strange? And wow. if so, who? Ooh. I would love to see Spider-Man. I mean, that would be pretty cool. Wow. You know, uh, that's tough. I'd like to see the vision. Just because I love the vision. I don't know where you'd stick the I vision in. I could see that. Mm. I could see that You know, happening. maybe right. some, maybe, it, it just as there's something that Doctor Strange needs that only the vision can give him. You mean like that gem on his head? Oh, maybe. Bam. <laughs> right? They, they got some though? gems. The vision? Yeah, the way they set up in the movie, I can't remember if that's like become central to like his life force or whatever. Like, I don't know. I, they're going to have to like, they're going to have to do something. Again. Which could happen in yeah. Doctor Strange. I mean, I would just like to see those two characters together. Like Just that. in their, their costumes that they're sure. swirling, maybe in some <laughs> astral realm where their capes are billowing right. in the astral I wind. I can watch a whole movie of Vision and Ultron actually sitting down playing chess for that would an hour. Be amazing. That, that would be like, that like the my Seven Seal. Seal. It would be like a Birdman yeah, right. movie, but, but in the Marvel, Marvel Universe. Totally. Dude, right. I'm going to set my Hot Toys figures up that way. <laughs> there you go. When I get the Ultron Bam. and the Vision, you gotta Instagram I'm going to send it to picture. you. Awesome. All right, next question. We got Steve Sark asks, do you feel like DC might be rushing a few things if you believe all the rumors for Batman v Superman to catch up with Marvel? What do you think? It It's impossible to say. First of all, you'd have to believe all the rumors, and, and you should always take that with a giant grain of salt. But even if all the rumors were true, you know how we often say, look, a three-hour movie may not be too long of a movie depending on the movie. A 90-minute movie may not be too short depending on the movie and what it's right for. It's all about how are these things handled. Some people say, hey, there's eight characters, that's way too many. But then you can get an X-Men film in there that has 17 characters, and it doesn't feel like too many. It all depends on how it's handled. I've said for years now that if DC gets their cinematic universe going, they need to do it the opposite of Marvel. Mm -hmm. It worked for Marvel the way they did it. But with the characters DC has, I always felt you need to start with something like Justice League and Batman v Superman with Wonder Woman in there and, and other characters, are, Aquaman's going to be there. That's kind of that. And then you splinter off your individual films. And if that's what they're doing, I think it's the right direction. So, hey, it could end up that they're trying to do too much. It all depends on how it's executed. We may say that coming out of the film. But from where I'm sitting right now, I think by the time Batman v Superman's done, we won't feel like they rush too much. stuff. I, I think they're handling it the right way. I, I do too. I mean, remember, Man of Steel is the first film in the DC Cinematic Universe. What we saw on that special last week of Wonder Woman mm -hmm. taking place in World War I, I mean, I didn't know about Captain America, the first Avenger, if I was going to like that taking place in World War II. I ended up loving that. Wonder Woman, look, in those brief clips, just the look of it, the fact she's riding on a horse and it's World War I Europe and she doesn't know she's supposed to help man's world. Right. I mean, I think they're making some good choices. Look, there might be a lot stuffed into Batman v Superman, but the fact that we already have Wonder Woman in production, I think they're, they're doing... I, I like the casting. I like what I'm seeing. Yeah. It's theirs to lose. I still don't like that we they haven't allowed us to hear her, Gal Gadot, say one single yeah. word yet. <laughs> that, Actually, that makes me nervous. The big surprise about Wonder Woman, she doesn't talk. She's a mute. What? She's oh a mute. my God, oh. you just solved the puzzle. Yeah, She's right. going to be mute. She's sign languages. Insane. But you're right. But I have to say, I loved her in the Fast and the Furious movies. Fast 4, Fast 5, Fast 6, why would you kill her? I think you're right. Them, them starting Batman v Superman to open up the Justice League. Like they start production on the Justice League, I think, in March. So it's literally a month and a half away. Um, they have to do it this way because they tried it in 2006 with Superman Returns and then a couple of years later with, with Green Lantern. Lantern yeah. Both of those films didn't work. They didn't feel like they were part of the same universe. They didn't try crossing them over. So they had to reset their game. Marvel just in the same years was like, look, look what we just did. We established all these characters and came out with this amazing group movie called The Avengers that no, none of us at this table ever thought we'd see an Avengers movie. Yeah. Or Come that on. it would all work, that all three right. of those movies would work. Holy God. Yeah. I didn't think Thor would work at all. No. Yeah, I mean, you think, like, how are they going to do, like you said, how are they going to do Asgard? How is this magical world going to meet, like, Tony Stark's science world? It's like, well, in our world, what you call science, bam, they did it. They just done. Tran done. And what you think science is, magic, blah, blah, blah. You just had Thor. They're one and the same. They're yeah. one and the same. Oh, that makes sense. Boonk. Yeah, it's insanity. So hopefully they drank the Kool-Aid. Like, I want to see all those people at DC just chugging the Marvel Kool-Aid because they're like, look, they did a good job. We got to reverse engineer it, but let's let's just stick with the comics, man. Let's use the greatest comics and use that in the movies. Well, you know, it's interesting. The one thing that I think that we forget, and I think it's a key factor, is that Zack Snyder works with his wife. 
and his wife is his producer. Mm -hmm. And I think that having a, a, a relationship that way, the, the, you know, it's like Gail Ann Hurd and James Cameron. Yeah. When you had that strong writer producer, a writer director mm -hmm. with a great producer team, I think sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But at least when it doesn't work, it, Sucker Punch I hated, but he right. was all in. Right. You yeah. Know, he was all in. And f whether you like that vision or not, it was a unique vision unto itself. And I, and I think Watchmen was not entirely successful for me, but again, strong vision. Mm -hmm. And I think I love Man of Steel. I think what I'm seeing out of this is going to be great. And I think that maybe it's Zack Snyder and his wife. Uh, is it Debbie Snyder? I'm yeah. not sure. Is Debbie, Deborah Snyder? I think the two of them are good. basically they're the Kevin Feige now. Sure. And as long as, because they're producers on the Wonder Woman movie too. Yeah. Let's hope that they're, it's all being pushed forward and thoughtful in an interesting way. And I think that the fact that there's a writer, director, producer team mm -hmm. is something that is, it gives me hope. Well, before we get to- I want to believe. I want to believe too, <laughs> before we get to the next question. Thank you, Holly Payne. She is my teammate on the, uh, the Death Superman Lives. What happened? Couldn't have done it without her. Uh, next question, Lemon Grab. He talks shit about her all the time when she's oh, not here, by the way. On. All the time, Holly. All, right. all the time. You know, don't listen to Campy. He's just jealous. All right, Lemon Grab <laughs> Ren asks, if Spider-Gwen was to ever transfer to live action, who would your dream casting for her be? I like Chloe Moretz. What do you think? Spider-Gwen? in the, you know, I guess it would be now in the Marvel Universe. Whether you like Spider-Gwen or not is not the question. Oh. Who do you think, <laughs> who would be good as Spider-Gwen? Seeing uh, now that Tom Holland is Spider-Man. Yeah, Chloe Grace Moritz is kind of the safe answer because we're all just thinking of, of her as hit girl. I mean, mm -hmm. so that that's, I, uh, She was great great in the, the remake of Let the Right One In. You know what, she can't act worth crap. I'm not talking about Chloe Grace anymore, by the way. She can't really act worth crap, but uh, uh, it would be a name, right age group, maybe the right look, maybe a Selena Gomez. Mm. But you'd have to just make her not talk much. So uh, what do you think? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, Clo uh, you know, I, I do like um, uh, younger sister of... Why am I drawing a blank on her name? She's she has we've watched her grow up. She has um, her younger sister. What am why am I not why am I not Full House? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. She was a great actress. Uh, but it's her younger sister, you're blonde. Why am I drawing a blank? Oh, you're talking about uh, you you're know what I'm talking saying. about from from um, the JJ Abrams film. She was the the lead little girl in the JJ Abrams film Super Eight. Uh, you're talking about Yes, um, I am. That's um, exactly what I'm talking about. Elle Fanning. Elle Fanning. Fanning. Elle Fanning. Dakota Fanning's younger sister. Yes. Elle Fanning. I can't Thank believe you, I, I did not know Dakota Fanning off the top of my head. I'm picking uh, from Diary of a Teenage Girl that just came out last last year, Belle Powley. She put, put out one of the most amazing performances that I've seen all year from a young actress. I would say she would be great as Spider-Man. I'm going with Carrie Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Fisher, that's not even possible. But I'm hey, Spider Gwen. All right. The next question we got is from Carl. I love will, Carrie Fisher. Will you ever do a doc animated or original film special? So, like, th I think what he's asking is, would we as heroes do like a special that's just all about all the animated movies that have come out? And I think you know why not? Maybe we'll do that as a special. I think There's, it's a kind of a cool uh, idea. I mean, like DC, like a sweatshop. Like Twenty-five they of them. Crank yeah. them it's out. impossible to catch up. Yeah. On that. What right. I mean, it'd be fun. I just don't think. Do we have a those those those? They're direct to video movies. Yeah. The DC right. movies. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be prejudicial. I've produced a, a direct to video movie for Warner Premiere, so I don't want to say anything bad. I like the Wonder Woman film. I like very much. Sure. I like Flashpoint Paradox. I mean, I liked a lot of the stuff that's come out, but do they warrant? I mean, if we did, if we went back and looked at the Batman the animated series. Mm -hmm. The Justice League sure. animated series, maybe. I would say if we were going to do it, it would be a, a very much more of an overview and not a very specific. Like right. I wouldn't list off every single movie that the DC animated, you know, the new versions. What I would do is talk about some of the cream of the crop, at least to me, like The Dark Knight Returns, that two part series that uh, Jay oh, Oliva yeah. directed. Incredible adaptation of the Frank Miller comic direct book. Direct adaptation yeah. too. It was yeah. it was a direct one, but they added stuff too. Like you know, I've combed over that. I've probably read the all that series 
over a hundred times. So any aberration or difference, I would be like, oh, that's a little different or, oh, they right. added this. And I thought all of the additions that they did were great and they only plussed the actual adaptation. So in that sense, there are a lot of great adaptations of both Marvel and DC. Well, properties. maybe that's the way in is that we look at them as adaptations of their source material. Mm -hmm. You know, you go back and then we could talk about the comics and the actual Sure, Animated well then I would say Justice League Unlimited, or well, I can't remember now if it was the Superman animated series that gave that, of the, for the man who has everything, that Alan Moore special. Well, they're doing that on Supergirl now. But they did, it was yeah. Justice League Unlimited. It was They right. did that, and that, I thought that was a great one. So yeah, that's a good idea. We'll do it sometime later in the year. Um, next question comes from one of my faves, Evil Abraham Lincoln. He says, <laughs> sup sweaties, uh, what role, if any, do you guys think the Green Lantern Corps will play in Batman versus Batman v Superman? Will Hal join the league? What do you think? In this version, are we even going to see Green Lantern? Nah. No, I mean, we, we, did, we just answered a question, too, about, you know, uh, are they trying to do too much, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, I said, no, it all depends on how you handle it, but your Green Lantern Corps is a big deal. Right. Like, that's a big piece of, a, of the puzzle. I, I just don't see it happening. I don't think we're going to see Hal Jordan in the DC Cinematic Universe until later anyway. Right. It's going to be, if there's Green Lantern, it's going to be Jon Stewart. I mean, yeah. you need, with all the diversity talk in Hollywood these days, hmm. big with the Oscars now, and... I think why not? I'd like to see. I mean, I thought Common as Green Lantern as John Stewart was a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that. I mean, I, I, I mean, can you believe we're seeing Martian Manhunter? I know, and he looks I mean, great. In he Super looks Girl. great. And he does look really flying good, around. Actually. It's pretty I mean, awesome. I, if, if you're not getting Martian Manhunter in Justice League, which we should, right? Because uh, I love Martian Manhunter, we should get John Stewart. Well, you got to think Superman and Martian Manhunter are very similar origins. Aliens right. from a planet that no longer exists or the last of their kind. So we've got one alien right now. I think, but only one eats Oreo cookies. Well, <laughs> well, I, we could save that for Just League Part Two. I think my, they'll eventually bring in Martian Manhunter, but I, I'm sure that Green Lantern. It feels pretty packed right now, but then again, it's not like uh, you know, like what is it? Civil War has like how many characters? Like fifty. Yeah, but we're talking about Batman versus Superman, right? And, like, not, we're not even talking about Justice League yet. So, no, the notion that they bring him in, and I, I, I'm on the opposite side of you. I do think that when you bring in Green Lantern, you bring in Hal Jordan because he's, to me, at any rate, he's the quintessential Green Lantern. But however you do, we heard we heard word that they were talking about like like a three yeah. key. It's a like, buddy picture. Guy, well, Guy Gardner and yeah. uh, it's like Green Lantern yeah. core, and they'll be like in outer space. That, well, that would be. Awesome. Yeah. Like yeah. if they did that. That's, that's a the, very cool idea. That, yeah, that's, that's their yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. That, exactly. That's that their is. smart ticket. That is their Guardians of the Galaxy that introduces outer, outer space. And I mean, then, they literally are the Guardians of the Galaxy. They really are. <laughs> yeah. That's like, that would be a mistake for them to not do that. Yeah, right? I agree. I just don't know if I want to hear Green Lantern's mixtape. So, <laughs> sweaty question of the week we've got is Sergio Mendoza asks I read an article about Ego, the living planet, being in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. What do you think? James Gunn got on Twitter, debunked it right away. Really? Yep. All right. Well, as far as for a rumor, I don't care what James Gunn says. I know he's making the movie. <laughs> what does he know? What does he know? What does James Gunn know? I, look, he put he put a, a celestial in yes, the did. first Guardians of Galaxy. Head. People live in the head. They yeah. like mine they, it. They exactly. live in it. It's so fantastic. Even though he debunked it, I didn't know he debunked it. When I read that, I was like, oh my God, I would die to see even one scene of them flying by a planet that's talking with a human face on it <laughs> that actually has a personality. Ego the Living Planet, one of the weirdest concepts that Jack Kirby has, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, I'm pretty sure it sounds very Kirby-ish. Like he's just like, Stan's like, why'd you put a face on that planet? And then Jack's like, oh, maybe he should say something. <laughs> Bam, you know how those guys used to work together? Whoever came up with it, it's one of the weirdest ideas. And every when I was a kid, I loved those Thor reprints that I was getting. Uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like all these reprints of the Thor comic that Jack Kirby and Stanley had done, and Ego the Living Planet, and Galactus were in it, and I was like, Ego the Living Planet is crazy. It's crackly Jack Kirby stuff going on. He looked like he had a mustache and a beard, and he was always angry. Right. I would be angry, too, if I was a giant living planet. It was just a face, like, get me out of here. You and know? you're stuck in an orbit. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't go anywhere else except around the planet. The I, sun, your, I your desperately orbit. hope that James Gunn was just, like, throwing us off the scent. Please put Ego in, even as a... Even as a flyby we're like oh that's just ego maybe He's that's like, the yeah. thing the collector sure most wants yeah. is ego he wants it for his collection <laughs> don't think he'd fit in any of his jars yeah that's well. right maybe he's the new collector you know, collector's inside of ego so that's where he went can you live on ego i don't know if he lets you he let a bunch of people land on him and he's like get off of me it's like an old man get off of my lawn but get off my planet get off my face yeah get off of my face well kids that's it for us 
You can watch episode 42 of Collider Heroes. Uh, where can we find you, Robert Meyer Burnett? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett, because that's what the kids like today. Right. Or find me at Twitter at Burnett RM or Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. Right on. John Campia, how about you? You guys can find me on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram or at anything, basically just at John Campia. And tell people like, you're almost done with the Pride. Yeah, well, the Pride coming out very soon. Uh, keep your eyes this is my new novel. Uh, keep your eyes open for it. Uh, we're going to be making an announcement really, really shortly. Awesome. Can well, we pre-order it? Not yet. Yeah, he'll, he'll let everyone know when you can get your hands on his special dragon novel. It's, I'm excited. So you can find me uh, just uh, at Instagram, on Twitter, just at John Schnepp. And you can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, uh, by going to TDOSLWH.com. Once again, you've been watching Collider Heroes. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you all next week. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.